My name is Eric Patterson. I'm an assistant director at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University, and I teach in the Department of Government. And on behalf of the Berkeley Center and our co-sponsors of tonight's event, the Program in Conflict Resolution and the Program for Jewish Civilization, I welcome you. Uh, let me say a word about the Berkeley Center. The center was started in the office of Georgetown's president in March 2006, and it's at the heart of a university-wide effort to make Georgetown a global leader in the study of religion and the advancement of interreligious understanding. Now, tonight's lecture is part of a day-long conference of events on applying the just war tradition to the issue of late and post-conflict. Uh, we hosted a dozen of the leading scholars from North America on this topic. The just war tradition informs not only the way that we think about the decision to go to war and how war is fought, but it can be extended to late conflict and to post-conflict, and that's what tonight's event is about. Uh, you have in front of you a short biography of Michael Walzer, so I will not reiterate that to you. But I would ask you this question, and that is, how do we measure the impact or the success of a scholar or of a book. Uh, he's had many prestigious awards, most notably the 2008 award of the Spinoza Lens by the Dutch government. But if I ask my students what it is that makes a great book or makes a impact on them, they say things like this. Well, is the book readable? Does it touch key dilemmas that last over a long period of time? Does it move across historical contexts? The enduring book that many of us know, Just and Unjust Wars, was written in the context of Vietnam. But does it have relevance today in the context of Iraq and Afghanistan? My students would say that uh, a scholar or a book that lasts is one that appeals to people from a lot of different walks of life. My students also say that a scholar who really gets to them is one who ticks off a lot of different people from a lot of different walks of life. Well, I wanted to test this theory, so I went to Amazon.com. And as many of you know, uh, it's one thing to have a positive review by other scholars. It's another thing for students, and it's often undergraduate students who rate the books at Amazon. And you'd be surprised, many famous books only have two or three ratings. Um, Walzer's books have dozens upon dozens of ratings by students. And let me tell you what students say we're at a university, so it's appropriate to keep in mind what they say. Uh, this from a student in Finland. No other book has created so much discussion about just war theory than this. It's a modern classic, easily readable, and has very little philosophical jargon. <laughs> Another student wrote, if you've ever found yourself questioning not only the justification for war, but the method by which wars are fought, then don't hesitate to give this book a read. Now, I have to say there were some negative reviews. One student said, I just don't get it. But six students immediately within days had responded back to the student criticizing them. In fact, one of those students criticizing the one who said he just didn't get it said this. The first thing I have to admit is that I haven't read Walzer's book, but <laughs> and then went on for quite lengthy citing the other important works that he'd written and why we should keep an open mind. One student said that Michael Walzer was a rightist. One student said he was a leftist. One student said that you would like the book if you're a pacifist, poli-sci, conflict resolution type. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you fit one of those categories here tonight. And perhaps the, a, a great recommendation from a student, I didn't find it dry. Uh, I thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> But many, many of them had uh, wonderful things to say. One said, and I think this really hits at undergraduate level thinking, I haven't read a great many books on military history or about the ethics of war. However, I would be willing to wager that Michael Walzer's Just and Unjust War is the penultimate book about the morality of war. And I think that's a great introduction to our speaker tonight who's had something to say to a generation, not only of undergraduates and graduate students, but to the wider American public. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Walzer. Thank you, Eric. I think I'm going to look at Amazon.com. 
Um, it's a little awkward to be giving the a keynote address at the end of a conference. Many of the things I'm going to be talking about have already been discussed uh, and discussed uh, very well. But then many of you were not at the conference. So um, I, I'm going to talk about what um, justice after war might, might mean. And as many of you know, um, jus post bellum as a distinct category is not part of classic just war theory. It isn't entirely missing either. The original idea was probably that post bellum justice was included in the criteria for ad bellum justice. The inclusion could have been twofold. First, a war can only be considered just if there is a, a strong possibility of of winning it, and in order to judge that possibility, you have to have some idea of what success would look like. And then the requirement of a just intention means that whatever is taken to constitute success has to be not merely possible, but also morally defensible. It has to be, if only in prospect, a just outcome. So arguments about what would come after the war were a crucial part of the arguments about whether a war should or should not be fought in the first place, ad bellum anticipated post bellum. But there is another sense in which the just outcome of the war is supposed to be anticipated in its beginnings. The standard understanding of aggression holds that it is a violation of the status quo ante. The war was at peace in such and such an arrangement of states and borders which was presumed to be just insofar as it was established, conventional, widely accepted, and also insofar as its stability made for regional or global peace. The aggressor violently disrupts this arrangement, moving an army across the existing border, and then a just war restores the arrangement and the border. Justice after the war is, on this view, the same as justice before the war. The idea of reparations gains its force from this understanding. The breaking of the old order has to be repaired. Though the violence of the aggression and the human damage that it produced cannot be undone, we can compensate the surviving victims and rebuild the ruined cities. We insist that the aggressor make things as much as it can, as he can, just like they were before. And that on this view, which I take to be the classic view, is the definition of a just outcome. It's worth noting that the early modern idea of political revolution derived from this conception of a just war. The tyrant started the revolutionary process by breaking the established constitutional order, attacking his subjects, violating their rights. Tyranny was understood as a kind of aggression. The people, organized perhaps by their lesser magistrates, justly defended themselves and restored the constitution. The movement was circular, ending where it began. Uh, a revolution that didn't end in a restoration would not have revolved completely. So just war and revolution understood in its terms are deeply conservative ideas, though what they aim to conserve is the peacefulness of the status quo ante. Not, it, not its particular political arrangements, which may indeed need to be changed, but only through normal politics, not through war. There are always state leaders who believe that their country's borders aren't where they should be, or that the division of colonial possessions and spheres of influence or the access to natural resources is fundamentally unjust. That may or may not be so. The status quo is usually unjust, though not in the way state leaders believe it is. In any case, just war theory holds that war is not a permissible remedy. When Francisco de Vitoria said that the only justification for war is an injury 
received, he meant a recent injury that violated existing conventions and arrangements, not an injury received long ago that had been incorporated into the existing conventions and arrangements. Territorial irredentism was no more an excuse for war than imperial ambition. Violent disruptions of the status quo were almost by definition unjust. The 1991 Gulf War provides a nice example of this classical understanding of postbellum justice, restoration for both sides, reparations for one side. The first Bush administration thought that its war was justly concluded when Kuwait was liberated from the Iraqi occupation and Saddam Hussein, his aggression defeated, was still in power back in Baghdad and able to pay reparations to Kuwait. Justice did not extend to regime change. It did extend to the imposition of restraints on the Iraqi regime, but the purpose of those, or at least their initial purpose, was to make the old border safe. This was a contested view at the time, especially because President Bush had called for rebellions against the Baghdad regime. And when these occurred and were savagely suppressed, he did nothing to help the rebels. Still, stopping the war after the liberation of Kuwait was in accord with the classic view of a just ending and a just peace. Now, there's much to be said for this view. Think of how many lives would have been saved if the Korean War had ended as soon as American and South Korean forces had repelled the North Korean invasion and restored the old boundary. However unsatisfactory that boundary was. Or imagine what the Middle East would look like today, might look like today, had Israel, after winning the Six-Day War in 1967, immediately restored the Gaza Strip to Egypt and the West Bank to Jordan. In both these cases, the ambition for a better peace than the status quo ante produced outcomes that were, that are, arguably worse. So one might say, as Avishai Margalit has recently suggested in his book, Compromise and Rotten Compromises, that the actual goal of just war theory is not a just peace, but just a peace. That peace itself, as it existed before the war began, and as it might exist after the war ends, is the actual goal without regard to its substantive justice. Given the awfulness of war, peace is what just warriors should seek. But is this, in fact, just any peace? Suppose that the aggressor state wins the war and establishes a peace that is not the status quo ante, but is still peace in the literal sense, the absence of war. Do we have to accept this kind of peace? or oppose it only politically, or is it morally permissible to renew the just war at the first opportunity? How long does it take before the new peace constitutes a status quo that it would be unjust to disrupt? We need some understanding of how peace and justice connect in order to answer these questions. I would suggest that the connection must be strong, but minimalist, so as to sustain the recognition that peace itself is a value at which we can justly aim and sometimes live with, even if it is unjust. But in this lecture, I'm going to assume the victory of the just warriors and ask what their responsibilities are after victory. And sometimes, I want to argue, sometimes, but not all the time, they must aim at an outcome that is different from the status quo ante and that is more than just a peace. Restoration and reparation may be right for the victims of aggression, but may not be the right way to deal with the aggressor regime, which they leave intact 
and in power? What if the act of aggression is inherent in the nature of the regime, as in the case of Nazi Germany? No one on the Allied side imagined that the war could end justly with Hitler still in power, even if his government then paid reparations to all its victims. The 1939 status quo was no one's goal. The Allied commitment to a just peace in Europe took precedence over the old European conventions and arrangements, and this meant military occupation and regime change for Germany. Though these weren't entirely new ideas, World War II made them into defensible versions of jus post bellum. The experience of Nazism also provided another argument for regime change. It seems astonishing today, but there were lawyers in Britain and the United States who argued in 1945 that the Nazi leaders could be put on trial for crimes against Poles and Russians, but not for crimes against German citizens. The killing of German Jews, Gary Bass reports in his fine historical study of war crimes trials, seemed protected by German sovereignty. Not justified by sovereignty, but protected from international scrutiny and indictment. This argument was rejected in the run-up to Nuremberg and again at the actual trials. State officials are not answerable only to their own courts when they massacre their own citizens. Other states can, I would argue that they should, intervene to stop the killing, and the officials responsible for the killing can then be brought to justice before national or international courts. The movement of military forces across an international frontier to stop, to stop massacre is not aggression. We call it humanitarian intervention, and it should be obvious that its goal can't be to stop the killing and leave the killers or the killer regime in power. Had African or European states acted to stop mass murder in Rwanda in 1994, for example, they would have had to overthrow the party of Hutu power, which ruled the country, and then they would have had to find other rulers. An intervention in Darfur in 2007 or 8 would have had to replace the Khartoum government, at least in Darfur. In the case of humanitarian intervention, jus post bellum involves the creation of a new regime which is minimally non-murderous and it is more than likely that the creation of a new regime will require some period, perhaps an extended period, of military occupation. These possibilities raise the question of jus post bellum in a new way. Was Saddam Hussein's savage suppression of Shiite and Kurdish rebels protected by Iraqi sovereignty? Or did post-bellum justice in 1991 require a march on Baghdad and the overthrow of the Ba'athist regime? I didn't think so at the time, though it does seem in retrospect that regime change and occupation could more easily have been justified in the circumstances of 1991 than in those of 2003. But that's not the argument that I want to pursue here. I only want to insist that the classical view of post-bellum justice is now subject to revision whenever we encounter inherently aggressive and murderous regimes. The identification of those encounters will be contested, politically argued about, but those are contests that we cannot avoid. Similar questions arise in anti-terrorist wars like that of the United States in Afghanistan. The invasion of Afghanistan has led to a long-term American military presence in the country after what looked like but was not a quick military victory. In Afghanistan and in Iraq too, the creation of a new regime did not come as planned after the war was over but in the midst of the war. What does post-bellum justice mean when wars don't end? 
What are the obligations that come with staying on and fighting on in those circumstances? And what are the obligations that determine the timing and character of getting out? These are new questions, and they blur all the old categories, and I do not have clear answers. Just post bellum is an aspect of justice generally, and like justice generally, it imposes obligations on its subjects. Before I discuss what those obligations are, I want to address the question of subjection itself on whom do the post bellum obligations fall? Consider a historical case. In Cambodia in the 70s, a maniacal left-wing regime was systematically murdering its own people. The government of Vietnam sent an army across the border to overthrow the regime and stop the killing. No doubt, Vietnam had geopolitical reasons for doing this in addition to the obvious moral reasons, but whatever the mix of its motives, stopping the killing was a good thing to do. China, by contrast, along with many other states, indeed along with all other states, did nothing to stop the killing. China sat and watched. And yet after the invasion, the Vietnamese had further postbellum obligations in Cambodia, and the Chinese didn't. This is an odd, though familiar, feature of moral life. People who do good in the world have more obligations than people who don't do anything. Volunteer for some worthy task, and you are quickly entangled in a web of obligations. You hardly have a minute to yourself. While the men and women who never volunteer for anything can do what they like with their evenings. The case is the same with states as it is with individuals. Once the Vietnamese had sent an army into Cambodia for the best of reasons to save human lives, whatever their other reasons, they were bound to keep on saving lives in Cambodia. They had to secure and maintain some kind of law and order and establish a non-murderous government to replace the one, the government they had overthrown. And when they didn't act selflessly to do that, but served their own interests by setting up a puppet government, they were subject, rightly subject, to strong criticism. Among, among just war theorists, there is great uneasiness about states that remain neutral in wars between an aggressor and a victim. Think of Sweden in World War II and perhaps also about states like China, in my example, that remain passive in the face of mass murder in a neighboring country. Still, in international law, neutrality and passivity are rights that come along with sovereignty. And if sovereignty by itself doesn't seem a sufficient cover for inaction, many moral philosophers would recognize the same right not to act on the ground that states cannot be obligated to put the lives of their own citizens at risk, just as individuals are not bound to put their own lives at risk to save the lives of strangers. So it is only the state that acts that makes the positive ad bellum decision that acquires the positive post bellum obligations. If we assume that the positive decision is a just decision, then once again, doing the right thing brings with it the obligation to do many more right things. There is no escaping the dire consequences of good behavior. Though I should add that bad behavior, again, in contrast to doing nothing at all, also brings obligations in its wake, as the idea of reparations suggests. Of course, if all ad bellum decisions were made multilaterally, the dire consequences would be shared. Post bellum justice would be a collective responsibility. But this is not possible in practice 
since the forms of multilateral decision-making available in contemporary international society are notoriously unreliable. Neither the Security Council nor the General Assembly of the United Nations, for example, would have backed the Vietnamese decision to invade Cambodia. And similarly, the Indian decision to invade East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, would never have been authorized by the UN, nor would the Tanzanian decision to invade Uganda and rescue its people from the murderous regime of Idi Amin. And yet these all were just, and it seems to me, morally necessary invasions. When a massacre is in progress, unilateral military action may not be the best response, but it is often the only possible response. And then the state responsible for the invasion and the rescue will also be responsible for the political and social reconstruction of the invaded country. Now, we can imagine an arrangement in which the second of these responsibilities could be taken on by states that had been unwilling to take on the first. They weren't prepared to fight and put their soldiers at risk, but they might be prepared to participate in the work of peacekeeping and reconstruction. Even if the ad bellum decision was unilateral, post bellum decision making could be multilateral. Of course, the state that had risked its own soldiers' lives might think that it was entitled to make all the decisions in the occupied country, starting with the security decisions. On the other hand, occupation and reconstruction are costly undertakings, and the intervening state might be eager to share those costs and willing, therefore, to share some of its decision-making power. It might look for help, however, and find that other countries felt no obligation to help. After all, they didn't invade someone else's country. How might we go about freeing the rescuers from the ongoing burdens of the rescue? If we believe that multilateralism leads to a better version of postbellum justice, we will have to make it a political project. Does it lead to a better version? Are obligations formally accepted by many states more likely to be fulfilled than unilateral obligations? There are well-known collective action problems here. Each state thinks that the others should do more, or it thinks that it can shirk its obligations because the others are already doing enough. Or one state's withdrawal or failure to perform brings the whole effort down as each of the others refuses to pick up its share. The work of a single state might go better, especially if in exchange for material support, it accepted some form of international regulation as in say a trusteeship system if there were such a system. That too would be a project and a difficult one given the history of trusteeship under the League of Nations. And it might seem especially hard not only to insist that intervening states have acquired obligations, but also that their performance of these obligations should be monitored by an international organization. Nonetheless, it isn't a bad idea. Now, what are the obligations of postbellum justice? I have described reparations as the obvious obligation of the aggressor state. Reparations can be extracted forcibly by the victors, or better, they can be the subject of negotiations, not so much between winners and losers as between the victims and their heirs on the one side and the aggressors and their heirs on the other. Consider the negotiations between Israel and Germany after World War II. The heirs come into it because of the postness of the justice. Jus post bellum is, in part at least, justice for children. It's important to recognize that reparations are a form of collective punishment since the burden is distributed through the tax system to all the members of the aggressor state, including those who oppose the aggression and those who are too young, as the Bible says, to know their right hand 
from their left. The, this collectivism is simply the consequence of citizenship, and I think that it can be justified though the enslavement of those same people forced to work for the victims of their state would not be justified. We penalize innocent people, including children in the aggressor state, in a constrained way in order to benefit innocent people, including children in the state or the people that was unjustly attacked. And that is post bellum justice, not perfect, but as good as it can be. But I'm more interested here in the newer obligations that go along with occupation and reconstruction. These can be extensive and demanding, but they also have limits, limits of two sorts, practical and moral. States are not bound to do or to try to do what they are not able to do. The, pos the probability of success, which plays a critical role in jus ad bellum, plays the same role in jus post bellum. The United States is not obligated to create a Swedish-style social democracy in Afghanistan. I'm not claiming that that was ever our intention, but we're not obligated to do that for the simple reason that we can't do that. Obligations are closely connected to capabilities. Often states try to do more than they can do because what they can do isn't exciting enough to win the support necessary for doing it, or they pretend to be aiming at great but impossible achievements in order to cover their real interest-driven goals. In any case, impossibility is a critical limit, and if we recognize it, we will be more capable of making realistic choices and of criticizing partisan and aggrandizing projects. The moral limits of postbellum obligations have their primary source in the people to whom the obligations are owed. The people who have been rescued, say, by the military intervention or the people whose brutal and aggressive regime has been overthrown. The intervening state can't then impose its version of a just politics without regard to their version. It isn't bound to do what its own citizens think is best. The local understanding of political legitimacy is a critical restraint on what just warriors can attempt, but it is not an absolute constraint. During the occupation of Japan after World War II, the Americans pretty much wrote a constitution for the Japanese, with consultation, certainly, but without much readiness to bow to Japanese political or social norms. One of the clearest examples of not bowing was the inclusion of an article that mandated gender equality, which had no place in Japanese political culture as it then was. But since the Constitution created a democratic regime and since it allowed for its own amendment, this seems to me a legitimate imposition. And it's interesting to notice that though there has been persistent right-wing effort to um, re repeal this uh, section of the Japanese Constitution, um, that effort has never been politically successful. So we might even say that the existing local norms and some minimal conception of human rights are competing constraints on what the intervening state can do. The local norms are important because the goal of regime change is a regime that can govern without the massive use of coercive power. It must be politically strong enough to survive the withdrawal of the state and army that set it up. Its legitimacy must be recognized by its own citizens, it must be able to collect taxes and provide the services that citizens expect. And these are constraining requirements. They rule out puppet governments that will be forever dependent on the firepower of a foreign army like those created in East Europe after World War II. But they also may rule out certain kinds of idealistic politics when the ideals are ours but not theirs. 
the positive obligations of just warriors after they overthrow an aggressive or murderous regime and stop the killing begin with what we can think of as provision. They have to provide law and order, food and shelter, schools and jobs. Of course, they will do this insofar as they can through local agents, members of the old civil service and the old army who, aren't, who weren't involved in the crimes of the genocidal regime and also internal opponents of the regime and returning exiles. But ultimate responsibility belongs to the occupying forces. The American army in Iraq in 2003 was radically unready to take on this responsibility after the overthrow of the Ba'athist regime. And we can take this unreadiness as a useful example. It was a clear violation of the norms of jus post bellum. This is true whatever the justice of the invasion and however the war was fought. Post bellum justice is independent of ad bellum and in bello justice in the same way as these latter two are independent of each other. An unjust war can lead to a just outcome, and a just war can lead to an unjust outcome. Once immediate necessities are provided, the critical obligation of the invading and occupying forces is political reconstruction. The obliga this obligation is the same whether a single state has supplied the forces or a coalition of states or an international agency. It's a hard obligation because what is required is the creation of a regime that can dispense with its creators, that can literally ask them to leave. The goal of Reconstruction is a sovereign state, legitimate in the eyes of its own citizens and an equal member of the International Society of States. As soon as that goal is reached, the occupying forces will probably be asked to leave and they should leave. It will be a test of the justice of the occupation that they have not created a puppet government and that they make no claim to permanent military bases or to economic privileges unavailable to other states. But they can aim at a friendly government. It's hard to imagine them doing anything else. This must be, however, a friendly government fully capable of acting in its own interests. Should they aim at a democratically elected government? I want to say yes to this question, not because democracy is the best regime, though I think it is, but because democracy has historically been the regime least likely to turn on its own people. I can imagine ways less formal than elections to produce a responsible government in a tribal society, for example. Customary forms of consultation may still be robust and effective, but democracy is generally to be preferred for the sake of its inclusiveness. The modern demos includes everyone, men and women, rich and poor, majorities and minorities. And so it offers greater protection than a regime of oligarchs or patriarchal chiefs or clerics of the dominant religion. Protecting women or better empowering them so that they can protect themselves is especially important since they are often the first civilian victims of war and the last beneficiaries of reconstruction. Giving them the vote is only a first step, but it is an important step toward guaranteeing their security. Jus post bellum is most importantly about social justice in its minimal sense, the creation of a safe and a decent society. But it is also about justice in the other sense, about doing justice to the perpetrators of tyranny, aggression, mass murder, and ethnic cleansing. I've already alluded to the Nuremberg precedent for the establishment of international tribunals, a precedent followed with mixed results in cases like the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone. Do justice even if the heavens fall is not a good idea in the aftermath of war. Jus post bellum's first aim, as I have been arguing this evening, is to stop the heavens from falling. 
Sometimes a clear judicial repudiation of mass murder and the punishment of the murderers is the best way to forge a secure peace. Sometimes security might require amnesties and public forgetfulness, and sometimes the simple exposure and acknowledgement of crimes may be better than trials in pointing the way to reconciliation. In these cases, these are life and death cases, just a peace takes precedence over a just peace, though we should certainly try to bring the two together. Finally, there are certain lingering obligations that may affect what I've called the timing and character of getting out. The invading and occupying forces must make sure that the new regime is in fact non-murderous, that is committed to defend and capable of defending the most vulnerable of its citizens. And they must make sure that the men and women who cooperated with the occupation in any capacity will be safe in its aftermath. And if any of them are not safe, they must be given the opportunity to leave with the occupying forces. They must be taken in by the occupying state. This obligation holds, again, whether the intervention and the occupation were just or unjust. The French, after the Algerian War, were bound to take in the Harkis, that is the Arab soldiers who fought in the French army, whom they did not take in and who were murdered systematically after they left. And the Americans, after Vietnam, were bound to take in the boat people. Indeed, the people who took to the boats should have been helped to leave before they had to do that. John Rawls's argument about privileging the worst off in domestic society has an analogy here. We should attend to those most at risk when ending the occupation of a foreign country. So war is a time of killing and being killed. The crucial requirement of jus post bellum is the end of the killing, the preservation of life. That is the minimalist reason that I've given for trying to set up a democratic regime. And it is the reason for everything else that invading and occupying armies must do for the provision of necessities, for special attention to vulnerable minorities, for movement toward gender equality, for something as close as possible to justice for war criminals and murderers. There is work here that foreign forces have to do. But ultimately, the work has to be taken over and sustained by the locals. The post in jus post bellum is not of indefinite duration. Moral and political requirements must be met over whatever time it takes, but the shorter, the better. Thank you. Marjorie Mandelstam Balzer, Department of Anthropology. Uh, I have a question about the trustee issue that you brought up very briefly and uh, hinted that it had some potential. Yes. The issue of the trustee uh, uh, kind of monitoring that would occur under certain kinds of conditions when you were discussing collective action. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Um, yes. Uh, it's, it's a question in my own mind. Um, uh, Kosovo is now ruled as a protectorate of, of NATO. Um, <laughs> And the question is, would it be better if um, NATO was a, a trustee, not a protector, a trustee in an, a system of trusteeships which was somehow um, uh, regulated, monitored by 
some kinds of international, some kind of international commission. Now, the history of the League of Nations doesn't um, doesn't lead, shouldn't lead anyone to be optimistic about such a system. And the um, the history of the UN so far certainly doesn't lead, wouldn't lead me to be optimistic about um, such a system. But um, as a as a long run goal. Um, it, it does seem to me to be a way of addressing the problem of unilateralism in um, humanitarian interventions and in um, political reconstructions. Um, one example might be the example of Cambodia, where um, although it, it happened over a period of many years, the UN did eventually come in um, and hold uh, elections and um, um, changed the regime that the uh, Vietnamese had, had set up. Um, so might it have been better if that had happened sooner? These are, these are questions, and I don't, I don't um, believe that the current development of international institutions is such that, um, that this is something that can, be, that can be done soon. I just wanted to suggest uh, especially to people who worry about um, or who oppose unilateral intervention, that there is a way of, of, of thinking about um, uh, constraints on unilateralism over time. <laughs> An unjust race to the microphone. Uh, Michael, terrific talk. Uh, great to hear you uh, talk about these issues. Uh, I wanted to invite you to kind of say more about some things um, and just kind of get your response. So you seem to be in favor of reparations. You said this kind of clearly, but I'm wondering if you also favor sanctions, uh, for example, in the post first Gulf War settlement, both reparations to be paid to Kuwait, uh, but then also the maintenance of quite serious sanctions uh, on Iraq through the 90s, and I'm wondering if you would endorse that. You also didn't mention much about demilitarization, demilitarizing a defeated aggressor, and I'm wondering what you thought about that. And then finally, uh, the whole issue of uh, war crimes trials for war criminals, as I know that you know, um, it's actually a divisive issue in societies that have been defeated by war. They feel it's an extra humiliation and it can actually prevent uh, um, you know, a kind of progressive attitude uh, uh, from being fostered by forcing war, cr uh, war criminals to trial. So I guess I just want to invite you to say, <laughs> what's your yes. attitude about sanctions and demilitarization and war crimes? Trials? Yes, okay. Um, well, I, I did uh, try to say um, that uh, the question of justice, of retributive justice after um, massacres and after the fall of tyrannical regimes and aggressive regimes, that that, that is a question that has to be addressed um, in each case and that there are cases where um, it, where I would, I would recognize, as you suggested, that um, full retributive justice may not be, for prudential reasons, the best way of moving forward and, and um, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or even amnesties um, a, um, as in the agreement um, that led to the re restoration of democracy in Chile, for example. Um, that, that may be um, the best way of proceeding. These are, these are um, uh, political judgments, I think, and we have to recognize the the um, the importance of um, of political prudence at these moments of uh, of transition. Um, I, I I do favor. Um, I, I do believe in um, the value of uh, both sanctions and demilitarization after um, after wars of aggression. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure that the sanctions on on Iraq um, had only that had only the purpose of um, of uh, stopping a, a repetition of um, of the attack on Kuwait. Uh, 
they had another purpose which needs to be discussed, which I, I am inclined to think justified in the particular case after the, um, the rebellions and the, and the repression. The, um, the sanctions were a kind of regime change for Kurdistan. The, the no-fly zone made it possible for the Kurds to establish effectively an autonomous regime. Not an independent state, but a, but a, a real autonomy in the north. Um, and I, I think that was probably a good thing for, um, for uh, initially it was a group of states that, that did it. In the end, it was just the Americans and with some help from the Brits. Um, but uh, I, I, yes, I, th I think that was, uh, that was a good thing to do. And um, the, uh, the argument that I put forward here about Jus Post Bellum wouldn't quite extend to that, so it, it does require that extension. And um, demilitarized zones um, Make make a lot of sense after a, after an aggressive war or um, or after um, well af after the overthrow of an aggressive regime. Yes, I I would support that. Hello, my name is Eric Herger. I am a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service, and I'm also a Doyle Undergraduate Fellow at the Berkeley Center. Uh, my question for you has to do with um, the obligation of states to intervene in cases of um, massacre of a people, either their own people, or in case of China specifically, which I'm thinking of, in um, Xinjiang and in Tibet, of people who are not ethnically their own, but within their state. Um, first of all, in this case, um, there can be little political action because of the seat of China on the Security Council and their political weight. And second of all, um, if there were to be some action which would have to take military action, um, what kind of I, what kind of postbellum solutions are there in terms of the leaders, um, considering that international tribunals, at least in the case of the ICC, um, could be vetoed because of that seat on the Security Council? So could you please elaborate on the issue? <laughs> I know it's a difficult one that um, the large states, the powerful ones, China and, especially, and Russia as well, really pose to the idea of just wars and Jerry Postbellum. Right. Um, you, you, you know, sometimes a, a traffic cop um, facing um, a, 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 a driver who is driving very, very fast in violation of uh, in, uh, the, the speed limit, but so fast that um, chasing him is going to endanger a lot of other people on the road will choose to stop a car that is going more slowly, um, but also above the speed limit. And that's a kind of prudential discretion that makes a lot of sense on the road, and it also makes sense uh, in international politics. Um, we stop the massacres that we can stop without um, putting even more people at risk than the people are, who are being massacred. Um, and it's not a, um, it is a prudential decision and it is not unjust to stop a massacre in uh, Cambodia just because we can't stop a massacre in, in Tibet. Um, and so uh, there, there have to be other kinds of responses to um, to cases like Chechnya or Tibet. There have to be political and diplomatic responses. There have to be responses out uh, by NGOs um, in international civil society. Um, there, there, there have to be um, um, political, maybe even economic responses, but um, um, it's, it's, it's simply a fact of political life that um, great powers can act in ways that um, we will stop uh, smaller states from acting and should stop smaller states from acting. Uh, my name is Paul Grenier. I'm an independent scholar um, 
And I, I, I want to sort of challenge the uh, sort of an underlying premise. And I guess it's that underlying premise which is the question more, more than perhaps the way it'll end up being formulated. Um, and and it, it's, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, but Max Weber said something to the effect that, uh, that a state uh, has no intrinsic end, uh, that, that you know, meaning the post-enlightenment modern state, it only has a, an intrinsic method, which is, well, parenthetically, it's monopoly on, but coercive force. It, and, and, and to the extent it has an end, it, it's in its own self-preservation. So I, I think from a Catholic perspective, particularly say of someone like William Kavanaugh, you could say that the enshrinement of self-interest in a modern state could lead to a state where, in order to maintain itself through the use of coercive force, a state would have a self-interest in an endless war, such as, for example, a war defined as a war on terror, uh, a technique which has no definable end. So I mean, couldn't it, so, I, so I, I'm sort of suggesting that the whole sort of communitarian rationality doesn't really have a way of answering th this problematic. And, and, and in, in, in fact, the war has been defined as, as if it has an end, when in fact, it perhaps neither does nor was intended to. Um, I, I think that uh, the part of that uh, statement that I should respond to is the, is the, um, is the critique of the war on terror. Um, I, I, I agree that the war on terror doesn't have a, um, the same kind of um, um, uh, end in view as uh, World War II had, um, nor does the war on crime or the war on drugs. The war on terror is, this is a, 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 a metaphor for a struggle against um, the murder of innocent people for political reasons. It's a struggle that is ideological and um, as well as military. It's a struggle that most often takes the form of police work rather than um, actual warfare, which is why the term is, is metaphorical. Um, but as long as there are people in the world and organizations in the world which aim at uh, the killing of innocent people, Whose, whose purpose is um, to achieve political ends, often very vague ends, um, by, uh, by putting bombs in supermarkets or um, flying planes into buildings. Um, as long as there are people like that in the world, then um, we should want our political leaders to be fighting against them and fighting by all the means um, that are uh, required to stop uh, the killing. And that includes, as I said, um, a lot of police work. It's mostly police work. Um, and it includes um, diplomatic work. It includes, I think, very importantly, ideological work, intellectual work. And sometimes it will involve warfare. Um, and, and in, um, in uh, cases where it, where it legitimately involves warfare, as in, I believe, in Afghanistan, um, we can hope for uh, an end in view, not for the war on terror, but for the war against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban in, um, in Afghanistan. Um, we can hope for an end in view, even if um, many of us are not optimistic about that. But that is, um, that is a, a one part of, and only a, a small part of, uh, the struggle to, um, to defeat terrorists in the world. My name is Alex Karjik. I'm with the, uh, the Policy School. I was hoping to go back just a moment to the, the idea of a just peace versus just a peace and attributive justice. Um, and I know you, you mentioned earlier that you had to take into account the political considerations when looking as to whether to have serious trial, uh, trial or something less, less sort of sanctions and, and punishment. Um, is there any sort of 
metric or idea, any associates we get to look at that. Uh, I also studied a bit in the economics department. It, it seems to me that um, if, we, if we set a standard somewhere, it may be easy for people to, to cheat in a sense. They just go right up, get upset. I could claim that I'm going to be very upset if you, if you try me and therefore I get away with it. Or What's a way to ensure that the right people get tried and the truly dangerous people we let off? Or what's the metric for deciding, I guess, is my question. If you have any, <laughs> any comments on that. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure that economists have a metric for deciding which banks to bail out. Oh, I, and I'm not <laughs> suggesting that either. I, just as a, as a theoretical idea, uh, how, how do we decide who, who would really get the punishment? Well, you have, to, you have to look at the circumstances of, of each case, and you have to um, talk to the people who are actually making, making decisions. Um, the, um, the, 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 the Chilean Christian Democrats and Social Democrats who negotiated the transition to democracy made a deal with the military. Um, it was, I assume, the best deal they thought they could make at that moment, and it actually produced a, um, a transition to a democratic Chile. Um, I would not second guess decisions of that, of, of, of that sort, uh, the way a Spanish judge tried to do when he, when he indicted uh, Pinochet. Um, I, I can imagine people getting decisions like that wrong um, I, I can also imagine how you could make a decision like that and then re rethink it 20, 30 years later and decide that after all, um, the crimes were such and the, transitions has been, the transition has been sufficiently successful so that you could now actually put some of these guys on, on trial. Um, and if that's a democratic decision, even if it breaks an old bargain, um, <clears throat> I think that would probably be a, a justified uh, thing to do. But I, I, would, I would look very carefully at the circumstances of each case, and I don't think there is a, a formula. Thank you. My name is Ben Bolger, and I'm at the uh, McDonough School of Business at Georgetown. And, uh, I've been impressed by how often time uh, the geography of the world, the lines that separate uh, different countries changes. If you look back historically, and I was impressed by your comment that, that there are uh, grievances that extend back a reasonable period, which warrant uh, reflection, and there's some that extend a little, little bit further in. That's in the past. Can you give us a little more enlightenment about where that line is? Uh, and I, I'm sure people have different views on that, but what, what is your just general guidelines? Um, you know, it's, uh, there, there can't be <coughs> a right answer to that question. There can't be an answer like 17 years. Um, uh, <coughs> um, I, I, I find it um, very, very hard, for example, to sympathize with uh, the Serbian contention that the fact that um, there was a, a, a heroic battle fought in uh, Kosovo um, in the 15th century, um, which was which became critical to the um, self-understanding of the Serbian people, uh, that that's a reason for um, holding on to uh, to Kosovo. Um, and I suppose I wouldn't think that if the battle had been in, in 1823 instead of in 14 something or other. Um, but, but, it, but how to, um, how to mark off the, um, the, uh, the, the years, how to count, um, how, how long uh, does an unjust settlement have to exist before it becomes, uh, that you're, again, you're gonna have to look at the case and ask what is the, uh, the living experience of these people now and how does it derive from what happened, what happened then? Hi, 
Hi, my name's Manuel Figueredo. I'm a freshman from Venezuela in the SFS. Um, I was wondering, you spoke about international intervention to prevent domestic regimes from massacring their own people, but how many people does a domestic regime have to kill for it to be considered a massacre? And also, are there other forms of uh, domestic policy that could justify international intervention? Yes, now that's a, that's a very good question and a very hard question, and it's like the last two questions. I'm, I'm asked to supply a, a number uh, which I can't, um, which I, I, I can't produce. In the, in the 19th century, the international lawyers invented this phrase, uh, acts that shock the conscience of humankind. Um, that's what justifies an, an intervention, and actually there is a literature on humanitarian intervention in the 19th century, um, and that's the phrase, um, acts that shock the conscience of, of, of all of us. Um, how, do you, I, how do you define such acts? Um, I guess we know them when we see them, like uh, the, the uh, Supreme Court Justice said about pornography. Um, I, um, I, I really don't know. What, what, what is the, um, what, what kinds of brutality, um, of political brutality, are we prepared simply to accept? And obviously we accept a fairly high level of political brutality. And if you just look around the world, um, the arrest of dissidents, uh, the torture of political opponents, um, the corruption of uh, elections by beating up um, um, uh, activists on the other side, uh, the censorship of, um, of newspapers. Um, all of that goes on in states that are fully legitimate members of the society of states. Um, now, it, it seems to me that, um, that, there, that we, in a different sense of the we, should oppose regimes of that sort. And I mean we in, um, well, on, on, on the left where I grew up, it used to be called internationalism. We, we were internationalists because we took an interest in uh, justice and um, democracy in other countries. And when there were people fighting for justice and democracy in other countries, we supported their struggle. We supported it politically. We supported it if we could financially um, with material help. Um, we supported it intellectually. Um, and and I, I, I think it's wrong to underestimate that kind of, um, of politics. Um, and sometimes it, it, it's a non-state politics. Uh, after the um, overthrow of Milosevic in um, Serbia, Yugoslavia, um, there were young militants from uh, Yugoslavia who turned up um, in Georgia and in Ukraine, um, helping the, the people who made um, the, the um, I can't quite call them successful revolutions, but the partially successful revolutions in those, in those countries. Um, that was non-state political action against repressive and brutal regimes. Um, and that's, I think, the, um, the, the, that's the response that we should uh, aim at um, in our own um, political, political lives, in situations where we don't want um, states sending armies across the border, uh, even though this regime is an, is, an, is an obnoxious one, we need to find other ways of of recognizing and protesting its obnoxiousness. Good evening. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm a graduate student in the Department of Government. And 
I wanted to press you a little bit on the notion that it's only the states who have taken the decision to initiate military action who bear obligations of reconstruction and, and after that action is completed. It, it seems to me that this is only plausible if you, if you take a rather conservative notion of obligation that's predicated on sort of a social obligation, like poll 100 people and say, do you have an obligation? Or, or an obligation or a sense that's predicated on would you be held to account for this? If you take obligation as a facet of ideal theory, it seems like you can imagine situations in which other states do have obligations to support the reconstruction. So to take an, ex I think there are examples from history, but to take one that I've been thinking about today, because we showed on this stage in this room a documentary um, about the failure of the international community to intervene in Rwanda that said that the United States had sent troops to evacuate its citizens um, almost immediately after the conflict started. Um, imagine that they had um, pursued the overthrow of the regime. Wouldn't Unimir member states have had an obligation to help contribute to reconstruction, if not other members of the international community who couldn't muster the political will to intervene in the first place? Um, you are talking now of, in terms of ideal theory, of course. The answer has to be uh, yes, of course. In my example of, um, of Cambodia and Vietnam and China, of course the Chinese had um, an obligation in, in, um, in the ideal world to stop what was going on. And, and they, since they had greater capacity than the Vietnamese, they should have done it uh, by themselves and sooner. Um, but but in, as, a, as a fact in the world, um, the Vietnamese went in and then they were there. And um, when they set up a puppet government, everybody criticized them.